Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you letting me be here. And I'm going to take this microphone off and walk around a little bit, if you don't mind, because in my profession, if you stand still too long, they call you a target. So I don't want to be considered to be a target. Um, I looked around also, and I've seen a couple of people that I've talked to about um, their service and being veterans, and I very much appreciate all the veterans. There is one that we really want to recognize. We have with us the former provost naval of the Naval War College, retired Rear Admiral Barbara McGann. Is Miss Barbara here? What a treat. Thank you so much. Now, you know, being Army, I have to pick at the Navy people quite a bit. So, uh, you know, we, we get along every day of the year except for one day when we play football against each other. But we do appreciate the Navy and everything they do. And we appreciate your service, ma'am, really do. I know that, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, really, what's, what's an Army guy going to bring to me about um, what we do, national dropout prevention and trying to keep children in schools and things like that? And what I'm going to talk to you about is a couple of things. One is about how we got to where we are, a little bit about how we developed what we do, and then I'm going to show you some of the ways that we work on keeping children in school, because our focus is engaging children, keeping them in school, and, and helping them to understand what is going on in their lives and why they should stay in school. And I'll tell you that uh, this all started when I commanded uh, Southern Iraq. I had the uh, all coalition and U.S. forces in Southern Iraq, and we were getting soldiers that were sent to me to go into battle that I felt like were not trained well enough to go into battle. So I wrote a letter, sent it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I said, I need you to train them better. They sent me back a letter, said, you're a general, you train them better. Sounds like, kind of like you telling the superintendent something, him turning back to you and saying, you fix it, you know, that kind of stuff. But uh, so we did. We <clears throat> backed out into uh, Kuwait, and we took over a bunch of schools that were vacant. And we, instead of flowing people into the airport in Iraq, we flew them into the Navy port in, um, in Kuwait, put them into schools, and we trained them there for three more weeks, intensive training, before we put them into battle. But we had the opportunity to interview thousands and thousands of students that were coming through there that were one year removed from high school, and we asked them, how do you like to learn? And they all were telling me, we don't want to talk to, we don't want to you know, hear from old people like you on a stage. And that kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. But it, uh, you know, it resonated. And we said, OK, well, how do you like to learn? They said, we like to learn virtually, visually, you know, technology, interactive, those things. So I wrote a paper for the Army that said, it titled Screenagers, which you see on the screen. And said the people that we're trying to reach, the people that you're talking to about being in school, staying in school, they're three screen learners. They learn off a cell phone, a laptop, and a television. And if we don't create our educational systems that way, we're going to lose a lot of the people that we're trying to reach. So we started doing that inside of the, the U.S. military. And I will tell you that today in the Army, we've done away with 90% of all the textbooks in the Army. Everybody gets a little a laptop or a, a, a CD player with all the information you need on it. And then as you progress, you get another one that helps you go to the next rank or helps you learn your job. But all that paper, all those books and all have disappeared. So uh, where we used to have sore backs from carrying all those field manuals, that doesn't happen anymore. So now you get, we've got a, a technology way of doing things. And that's, that's really where it, what Screen Agers came about. But I'm going to talk to you about several things. And, and again, I looked around to see um, if I had served with any of the veterans here. And I saw that I did not. And that's a good thing because you know, nothing messes up a good war story like an eyewitness. So, so I want to make sure I, you know, to tell, yeah, you got to tap dance a little bit and tell the truth on these things, but it's always good to know who's in the audience. But um, let me see if I can uh, figure out this high technology. Now, I've got two technology devices this morning. I'm good at one, but two sometimes give me trouble. So I got a microphone and a clicker. So we're going to see how we do here. Okay, let me talk a little bit about <clears throat> what we see from my business side. Here's... This is the future of work. If you have not seen these figures, uh, this is what the New York Times and several other agencies have said, this is what it looks like right now in the, in the world. We have 15.7 million new jobs by 2020, 123 million high-skilled workers needed, 5 billion people connected to the internet, 26 million STEM jobs available in the US right now, and the most important thing that employers are looking for is creativity. If you think 10 years ago, when they asked that question, the most important thing they were looking for were math and science skills. Now it's creativity, and the other is the ability to get along with people. So let me ask you how you think we're doing with this. All right, let me show you a couple of things. 15 million new jobs, 
none, nobody right now trained to fill any of those jobs that are going to be coming around by 2020 because most of those jobs are still being created. We have, we can provide 50 million people for that 123 million workers needed by 2020. Slides are a little slow. Uh, down there where it says 26 million STEM jobs available, we're only graduating 1.5 million STEM graduates this year. Now, let me put that 26 million in context for you. That's two jobs for every unemployed person in the United States right now. So for everybody we've got unemployed, there are two jobs there that if they had the right qualifications, they could fill. But right now, we don't have anybody that's qualified to fill those jobs. And then, whoop, let me back to see, see if I can back this thing up there. Oh, there we go. So the problem with us is how do we keep the students in school? How do we focus them in the right areas? And how do we engage them to the point that they get excited about what they're doing and they think through their problems and they get past their problems and they maintain their focus and they stay there? So let me talk a little bit about how we did it, why we did it, and what we did with the military. <clears throat> now, I started out infantry. You know, infantry are uh, great soldiers. They walk. But as you get older, you get tired of walking, and they changed me to tanks, which was a good thing because I got to ride on tanks. But one of the things, one of the problems that um, we came up with in the military, and, and this is one of those, I think I created some of the problems that we have with uh, national drop, with dropouts back in the 90s. The Army was trying to say, we need a better educated workforce inside the Army. So they put together a team, said, write a program on how to increase the uh, education level of the people we have inside the Army. So I led that team, and I'm the guy who wrote the thing for the Army, the first thing that said, we can't accept anybody anymore that's not a high school graduate. Now, let me tell you why we had to do that. The first tank I got into to move the gun, you know, the gun, big tube sticks out there, to move the gun left or right, there were two hydraulic cranks in the tank, and you sat there, the gunner sat there, and he turned the cranks, and the hydraulics would move the gun left or right. That's the way that all the guns were done. But the last tank I got into has 22 computers in it. If you cannot, the first thing you have to do when you get into a tank now is you have to program all of the weather data that goes along with each bullet because each bullet that a tank shoots is controlled by all the weather data of humidity, barometric pressure, flight time, spin time, all those. And if you cannot pr uh, program a computer, you can't be a tanker in the Army. Well, more and more, the Army, and, and when I say Army, I'm talking about all of the armed forces, we've elevated everything to the point that if you come out of school, if you drop out and say, well, I'm just, you can't get in the military. There is no place in the military now that will accept you without a high school graduate. I mean, high school uh, diploma or, or uh, equivalent. And the problem is, is that the technology inside of the military is growing so fast that we have to have people with a higher level of learning, higher level of understanding in order to use some of the, the programs and things that we have inside of there. One of the big things we also had to do is teach cultural awareness. And I'll tell you a couple of things about that. When, we, when I first went into Mogadishu many years ago, we were there when they did the, the Black Hawk Down program. Um, we thought, okay, we're going to educate the people in Mogadishu about what we're doing. So we wrote out this great program. Uh, we flew over these, all these villages. We dropped out leaflets. And then when we went in with the Rangers and our teams, we went in to, uh, a, few late, uh, a few weeks later to, to go in and talk to the chieftains. We found all of our pamphlets had been taken. They had used them to stuff the cracks in their mud houses to stop the wind from going through. And we found out that, you know, even though we had written them in their language, they don't read at all. So we found out, you know, you've got to make sure that, that you're building your, your materials so they meet the audience that you're after. The other thing, when we first went into Afghanistan, we would go sit down with the, with the village chieftain there, and we'd say, let me tell you what we need to do, and we would give him maps, and we'd talk through targets and all this, and we were not getting the message across. And we finally found out that the way they send messages from one village to the other is the, the uh, chieftain brings in a young boy runner, and he sings a song to him to teach him the message. And then the, the boy runs to the next village, goes there, and he sings it to that chieftain. Well, when they first told me we had to sing our messages to the, to the, to the chief, I was a little concerned because I didn't really want to be singing you know, military programs to this chieftain about how to do this. But what we had to do was get them to the point where we could give them information, they could sing it to the, to the, the young runner, the runner would young to the next village, and he would sing it to the next chieftain, and we were able to start building some synergistic teams. 
And I only tell you that is, is to tell you that when you start looking at the people that you're trying to convince and staying in the schools and the people we were trying to convince to up their education in order to be in the Army is you really have to understand who you're talking to and how they receive information. And again, all this is leading up to the technology I'm going to show you in a few minutes. The big thing, though, that makes a difference in companies, military units, states, counties, schools, you name it, is leadership. And I know that all of you probably know more about leadership inside of schools than I do, but I have spent a long time looking at leadership, building leaders, training leaders, and there's a few things that I know that, that really help things. And one is, if you're going to be, and we'll just talk about just schools, if you're really going to focus on your school, you have to understand the DNA of your school. You have to make a decision, my school is going to absolutely stop the dropout program problem, or my school is going to be a school that has a great football team and at the same time we'll, you know, we'll try to stop dropouts. And I'll give you an example of that. I was in a school this past week that had a severe dropout problem. They have severe academic problems. They were trying to figure out why. They were looking at our technology, said, how can you help us with this? And I said, well, let me look at your school. How are you organized? And let's look and see what we can do. And I found out that, that um, they had just let go of their math coach. They had just let go of their science STEM coordinator because they said, we just don't really have the money to fund them. But they had 14 coaches on staff. They had uh, coaches that were teaching tennis in the spring and nothing else the rest of the year. They did not teach any regular classes. They were just a tennis coach at a high school. So I told the principal, I said, I don't think you understand you know, your DNA. I think that what you're saying is we want to have both, but I only want to put out the outlay for one. You know, I want to have the outlay so we're a great um, athletic school, but I don't really want to do what I got to have, have to do in order to be an academic school or to help stop the problem with people quitting in the middle of their program here. We're doing a program in Phoenix City, Alabama right now. Um, we're building a technology center there where it's going to have our technology in it along with some other things. And the main purpose of that is, is not to bring technology to the schools in Phoenix City. It's to stop people from st stop students from deciding in the ninth grade that they've had enough education that they can go down to the local automobile shop or to the, to the Army base there in Fort Benning, Columbus, and get a job. And what they're trying to do is say, and we, we get them to this point, they're excited, but then about the ninth or tenth grade, they start looking at how to make money, and they, they drop out of school, and we're losing them. So we need a way to help keep them and capture them here. So we're building a technology center with them there. So leadership is, is probably the most critical task that we can see in any school that makes a difference. And it's, it's just one of those things that you've got to invest the time, you've got to invest the money into it. And you know more than I do that when you're talking to students about keeping them in school, they have to trust you, you have to show them that you care, you have to be empathetic, and then you have to give them hope. And let me tell you a little story about, about hope. When we took over uh, South Baghdad, we found out that a lot of the things had Saddam Hussein had used a lot of things to stop uh, people who didn't support him. So like the Bedouin tribes, uh, children didn't wear shoes, so they couldn't go. He made a law, you, if you don't wear shoes, you can't go to school. So none of the Bedouin children could ever go to school. We, uh, he said, if you don't support me, you don't get electricity to your community, you don't get water, those kind of things. So we built one of the power plants back. We turned on electricity, and electricity ran out this long cord we had built, a long um, string of poles we had built out to this village and then from the village out to another little place, finally to a little mud hut out on the end of the run. And when they flipped the power breakers on, this light bulb came on in this three-room mud hut. And these three generations of family living in this one big room mud hut cheered and clapped and laughed and had a great time because a light bulb came on in their area. Well, when I talked to the, the sheik, which was a little unusual for us Georgia boys to do anyway, we found out the hard way that you know, Arab men don't shake hands, they kiss each other. We had, had a hard time figuring that one out. Uh, we had to, because you, you have to learn to lean left first, because if you don't, you end up with a mouth of Arab guy, and you, you, know, you have to fix that. So again, part, back to that cultural awareness thing, you got to learn to lean left first, then right first, and then that, so you can get on the same sheet. But we talked to the sheet, we went through that program, and I asked him, I said, Sheik, how come these folks are so excited about one light bulb coming on? And he said, well, you know, you Americans don't really realize what you do when you come to town and turn on the light bulb. You know, it's not electricity that we need. 
It's not the fact that you come in here and rebuild our roads. It's not the fact you come here and rebuild our schools. You bring us something that we've never had before. I'm an old man. I know my life is hard, and my life is going to be hard, and I've accepted that. My children live in the desert. They know their life is going to be hard, and they've accepted that too. But for my grandchildren, I want a better way of life. And what you bring to us that we've never had before is hope. You bring hope to our grandchildren, and for that, I'll always be your friend. Now, I've been gone from Iraq now for 10 years, and I still get emails and postcards from this Arab sheik. And he says, my grandchildren are living a better life because of the things that y'all did over here. <clears throat> That's the things that you do when you help stop dropouts in schools, is you, you have to give children hope of what they are there in schools for so that they will stay in schools. So that's just a little bit about how you know, we got here and what we do a little bit. So let me talk about a little bit about you know, how well do you know. You know, I told you we, we had to really focus on getting to know the Arab culture before we went there. We had to focus on understanding the language. We had to teach them things like you never show the bottom of your feet to an Arab because that's the deepest insult you can give them. Um, if you remember a few years ago, one Arab guy threw shoes at President Bush, that's, that's because he was trying to insult him. It wasn't he was trying to hit him, he was just insulting him because he threw his shoes there. So let's see how good you are. Let's see how, how well you know your, your, uh, your audience here. All right. How many of you can do emails? Everybody should raise their hand. There you go. Okay. How many of you, again, it's fast click here, can do Facebook? Facebook is an old person's game, just so you'll know. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, now, if you, just so you see these, if you, if you can really do these, you ought to just send me a note that says, I got it, or something like that, so we can check you. All right, let's see. How many of you could go to YouTube right now and pull up a video? Oh, I'm seeing less hands. Okay. How many of you can tweet? I am really surprised and really pleased. All right, that's good. We're, we're just about there. All right, what is this one? Instagram. How many of you can take a picture and post it on Instagram? Okay. All right, how many of you understand what snap, chat, pin, post, or tweet means? Okay, all right, good deal. I just want to make sure we're all talking the same language here because, you know, when we went into Iraq, we had to teach people Arabic. When we went into Afghanistan, we had to teach them Pashto. So when you go into a schools or when you're trying to build your team to work, what language do you have to speak? Is it English? Have you ever listened to a bunch of millennials talk? They don't speak English. They, they have, I mean, there's some English words in there, but they don't speak much English. They mostly speak geek speak. I mean, that's it. If you can do these kind of things, then you can really relate to your audience. So that's one of the things that you need to be able to do is, you know, Figure out what language they're speaking. Talk to them their way. The other thing you have to understand is they have figured out how to make any conversation you've ever wanted to hear less than 140 characters. They can take war and peace and describe it in 140 characters. I mean, think about it. So what that means to you is they don't want you coming to them with a long, flowery program about how to do things. They want to know the bottom line up front. In the military, that's one of the things that we did. And we, um, when we first got to Afghanistan, I had these great young captains, and they were building me posters about here's the way the tribes look, here's the way the ground's laid out, here's the thing. They were doing PowerPoints, and they were the biggest gobbledygook you'd ever seen. So we developed a term, BLUF, bottom line up front. And I said, give me the bottom line up front. If you can't give it to me on three slides, you know, you're not going to be able to explain it to me. So we started doing that, so the word got out that we had outlawed PowerPoint in Afghanistan. So I got a, a letter from the chairman of Microsoft, and he said, hey, uh, we understand that you've outlawed PowerPoint inside of, uh, inside of the Army there in Afghanistan. That's one of our biggest programs. We really would like to talk to you about this, see if we can get you to change your mind. I said, well, great. Meet me on Hilltop 720 at Friday at 12 o'clock, and I'll be glad to discuss it with you. He never showed up. He didn't come to Kandahar to, to talk to us about that. So, but but you got to be able to talk to him those languages and make it so that it's meaningful in a little way. You don't talk down to them because one of the things that I found out, they don't want to hear this, that, well, when I was your age, I was, they don't want to hear that. They are on their own. They are trying to be successful and they're trying to move forward, and they fully expect you to give them the respect that they need because 
they understand something that most people my age have, a, have, a tr have trouble understanding. And that is in the middle 70s, middle 80s, every business you ever thought of was a triangle. Chairman at the top, up under them, the board of directors, or up under them were workers all the way down. Schools, same way. Superintendent, principal, all that. That was the power structure of the United States in the 1970s, up 1980s. <clears throat> Excuse me. But something happened in the late 1970s that completely inverted that triangle. What was that? The personal computer. In the late 1970s, the personal computer came out, and all of a sudden, the young people coming in at the bottom of the triangle had more new relevant information than the chairman. So what happened was, instead of just being the newbies, they became the power people because they had the information and they changed things. So when that structure changed, you know, it took a while to get there, but the millennials coming in, they absolutely understand that they have to teach us how to program our VCRs, which we don't have anymore, but, and how to do tweets and how to do those things. They, they understand that's their position. So uh, they want to be treated with respect, and they want to do it in less than 140 characters. All right, so no old guy on the stage, virtual, interactive 3D, but the, most, the biggest thing I want to talk to you about is the bottom one there. One of the things that if you're going to engage students and keep them engaged and keep them in school is you have to also realize that the young people that we're dealing with have figured out that swapping hours, swapping time for dollars will not get them where they want to go. So if you talk to them about, we're going to let, we, you have to stay in school so that you can graduate and go get a job at the Kia plant down the road, they think, Time for dollars equals a dull life. What we found out is you have to convince them to swap time for dreams. You have to convince them. You have to understand them well enough to say, what is the most important thing to you in life? I talked to a young lady the other day. She's 12 years old. She says, I want to be a heart surgeon. And I said, well, has your family doctor? She said, no, my, my mother and father didn't graduate from high school. I said, you want to be a heart surgeon? She said, I want to be a heart surgeon. What can you do to help me? That's what they want to do. They understand they have dreams, and they've seen that you can make these dreams happen if everything falls in place. So what they're looking at is, why should Mark Zuckerberg be able to invent something that took him a very small amount of time and be a billionaire, and they go through school spending hours against time to work at Hardee's or Wendy's or something like that? So what they're looking at is, how can I swap my time for my dreams? And what we have to do is convince them school is the key to getting you there. Because if you do that, then they will focus on what they're doing, and they'll move forward, and they'll keep focusing on that. All right, so let's see here. I want to show you the biggest thing that you can do for them in order to get them there. When you talk to students, or when we talk to students, when we talk to schools, one of the things that leadership has to do is you have to paint a picture for those students or for that school or for that class so that everybody understands exactly what the picture looks like and understands they're part of the picture. So they can see, okay, here's what's going to happen in, in my community. Here's what's happening in my state. Here are some things I can do. Make it simple enough everybody can buy into the process and exciting enough that it builds excitement, momentum, and hope. Again, that's back to that hope thing. When we talk to students, you have to get them to the point where they are they're, they understand there's a dream out there that they can achieve, they can go and do that, but they gotta figure out how to get there. And then realistic enough to make sure they have reachable goals. You know, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to tell a four-year-old or a six-year-old or an eight-year-old, yes, you're gonna be an NFL player because, you know, there's only 140,000 people that it narrows down to uh, about 14,000 people that can actually be on any NFL roster at any one time. So. When you start looking at that, maybe they need to relook at their goals. We want them to support them and let them play all they can, but we got to get them to some realistic goals and say, this is, this is what we really think we can do. So we're at the point where we're going to talk a little bit about technology. And I'm going to, um, in just a minute, we're going to play a video. But what I want to tell you is what we focused on in the Army and what we're focusing on now as a company is helping students reach part of their dreams, whether they have basic math skills, basic reading skills, basic, basic edu uh, English skills or not. If they don't have basic reading skills, we still want them to learn. 
We want to give the instruction to them in a way that they can grasp what's going on and they can learn. When we start the video, I want you to pay attention in the first few seconds to the young lady there that's working at the screen because I want you to see the reaction she's having to doing this. This is a school, the first school there that the snapshots are out of, this is an underperforming school and these students, this is one of the first times they've ever worked on an interactive computer. So with that, sir, would you please run the video? So Look at that expression. We've worked with computers and then we've seen movies in 3D, but we've never got to really interact in 3D, so it's the first time you can really, you're almost a part of the actual machine. Our goal here in Plainview was to put these machines in front of as many students as possible within this one year. When we found out about it, we all like, trampled each other to get towards the door <laughs> so you can like, get on the computer first. Put on our 3D glasses, we were just all like, wow, and we just started seeing what we can create the lesson planning that went behind this, it really brings it to life. I can have kids engaged. Our fifth grade teachers during professional development from ZSpace were able to collect and put together a folder with all the lab experiences that they wanted to share. So now they have everything ready to rock and roll when they're in there with the students. You can get a lot more done in your 42 minute period. Setting up some of these labs would be impossible in those kind of time frames but you can walk into Z-Space and have the thing saved for the students all ready to go. Our fifth graders are working with the application called Newton's Park, and that's the same application that the AP Physics students use was Newton's Park. So it's interesting to see how it's being used at a high school AP level and in a fifth grade level. Sixth grade is using Franklin's Lab. Then they're going to go back into the tech shops and actually design their own electricity boards. Then they're going to go back to Z-Space and create these electricity boards that we would never be able to afford or be able to let them do for safety reasons. What I love about this is the collaborative approach in the sense that I have two students, one with a stylus and the other student with the glasses on being a part of that lesson and they need to work together to problem solve. You can see what works and what doesn't work. Everyone's learning together. Those inquiry skills I think are second to none with a device like this. Okay, would you switch screens, but Richard, if you will, hold off on the demo yet. Let me just talk a little bit. Okay, Richard, just hold still right there. Okay, what I wanted to show you is that schools have changed since I was there, and they changed since you were there. How many of you have, are using any kind of an interactive system in the programs that you do, whether it's in a school or in the programs that you do to support schools? Okay, excellent. There's a few hands up there, and we want to see more, but what's happening is Again, students want to learn by putting their hands in the middle of it. They want to be able to do it, see it, feel it, touch it. So some of the problems, I mean, some of the programs that are being developed, and, and very fortunately we were part of it, we were the ones that developed it inside the Army, but we can now put a computer screen on your table that you can reach into, pull a heart out, put it in your hand, and you can feel the heartbeat. We can put a butterfly inside there that you can pull out and set on your hand, and it'll sit there and flap its wings so that you can see the butterfly. We can put robots in there that you can pull out and you can build a robot and it's all in the air in front of you, test the robot, see if it works, and when you finish, put it back in the machine. Uh, if you don't like it, change the color, change the size, whatever, and then send it to a 3D printer. It'll print it out and then the robot will walk across the floor. The interactive things that we were trying to build to capture the attention of students has really taken off. Now, over in the, on my right over here in the corner is my, and I, told him I was going to tease him and say, my lovely assistant, Vanna Richard, over here, Vanna White Richard, a boyer over here. Um, Richard is actually sitting at one of the machines. And Richard, we're going, to, we're going to do a demo. I want you to actually see that that video is not something we just put together on TV. Richard, pick up the heart and pull it out of the screen towards you. Pull it towards you a little more. I want you to see how far he's bringing it out of the screen in the air over there. And then what we can do with this, this little machine has about 1,000 programs in it. Uh, drop it on the portal. Let's go to the biology screen. So if you want to work on the heart, pick up the heart, Richard, pull it out of the screen. Now, what I want you to see is uh, pull it a little more straight towards you, Richard, so it comes completely away from the TV screen. There you go. So what I want you to understand is that all of you are seeing 
this without putting on a special pair of glasses, without having to do anything special. I mean, what you're seeing is him pick up that heart, pull it out in the air, and turn it around and manipulate it uh, just with an electronic pen. And just so you know, when he picks up the heart, he feels the heartbeat in his hands. And if he messes up, the heart quits beating. No, and it's not, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, I was just trying to put a little fear in Richard over there. So, But with that machine, with that, we can change. Um, as you see, you can turn around to see the back of the heart. We can, um, we can Richard, left-click on it and make it uh, um, apparent so you can see through. Yeah, you, so now you can see clear inside of the heart. You can turn it around. There's a camera up there. You can pick up the camera, push it inside the heart. You can see the, the uh, valves beating while the heart's um, while the heart's beating. So as you see now, he's pushing it inside the heart and then up in the upper left, upper right corner of the screen, you can see the, the where as he goes across the valves, the little whites, that's the butterfly valves beating inside the heart. Or you can go over and click on the running man. The EKG up at the top tells you the heart rate. So he can go over and click on that and we can change the heart rate and the EKG, again, all on a computer screen and all with the heart hanging out in the air. So that the students actually, instead of just seeing a picture or seeing a video, they get to pull the interactive heart out of their hand and hold it. So let's say they don't want to be a medical doctor. So Richard, let's do a robot. So let's push that back and uh, pull the robotic arm, pick it up, put it on the portal there. We're going to go to a robotic program. So now we have a robotic arm, and we can pick the skin up. You see how fast? I mean, just that fast, you can pick up and take apart or put together uh, a robot, a car engine, a jet engine, anything that you want to build. So the technology has changed so fast that we, again, we developed this because we were getting so much technology equipment in the military, we couldn't teach people fast enough by standing up here pointing at PowerPoints. And you got to understand, we were teaching critical path thinking skills. So let me give you an example of what we were teaching. How many of you, any, do we have any math teachers in here? All right. You, this is for you, Okay. Okay, remember the math uh, word programs where you got a train leaving New York, going 50 miles an hour, one leaving Los Angeles, going, okay. We didn't teach those in the military. But here is what I had to teach people that came to me that were 19 years old, one year out of high school, first time they'd ever been on a plane, first time they'd ever been in a foreign country. These are the word programs I had to teach them. You're sitting on a Bradley fighting machine. The maximum range of your weapon is 3,600 meters. You're told to move out down Route Tampa at 50 miles an hour. Two miles away, you see a car coming towards you that looks like it's heavily weighted down. It's moving at about 50 miles an hour, too. If it has a bomb in it, his blast kill ratio is 500 meters. How many seconds do you have to decide before you're going to shoot and kill that person? Now, that's a word program. Now, 19 years old. That's the kind of programs we had to teach them so they had to be able to do immediate, interactive thinking, critical thinking skills, make the right decision, shoot or don't shoot. So that's what we, that's what we developed these things to do is to shorten that path, increase that retention rate, absolutely make them understand the critical path skills and be able to pay attention to all the things going on around them so that they would be able to make better critical path decisions. So that's what we were doing with the technology. Richard, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back to the slides. Would you switch me back, please, sir? All right, so we created engagement. I showed you the video. Let's see if I can get to the next thing. All right, I know everybody says, okay, everything's too expensive. Well, I'm going to tell you this. Schools have money. I have not been in a school in the last six years since we've been doing this that did not have money. What I have been in are schools that are spending their money in the wrong place. Again, the school that said, we can't afford any technology, but he had 14 coaches on staff. We've been in schools who said, hey, we've decided that we, don't, we can't afford technology for our students, but we're going to spend $2 million on a new scoreboard for the football field. And yes, some of it came from boosters, but a lot of it came out of the technology fund for the school. Schools, <coughs> excuse me, schools have lots of pots of money they can pull from to, for technology and engagement, lots of things they can do to, to, to help uh, schools. The other thing that I preach and teach every day is that legislators should be throwing money at schools to stop the dropout problem. Now, here's the reason why. All right, we're in, we're in South Carolina, and South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, all the southeastern states compete against each other all the time to get businesses to move there. 
So let's say my hand right here is the level where people get out of school in Georgia. But we got a new company that's coming to town and they're looking at all the states. And, and this, where the microphone is, is the level that they're going to have to hire people at. So there's a gap between where they're graduating from school and where the workforce has got to be trained to. What do you think fills that gap between that graduation level and that workforce level? Money. Money. The only thing that fills that gap is money. Somebody has to pay to train that workforce up to this level if that company's ever going to locate in that state. So if you don't, if the company doesn't do it, the state or the taxpayers have got to do it, or the schools have got to do it, or guess what? The company won't go to Georgia. They'll go to, say, South Carolina, where the graduation rate may be here, so there's a shorter gap. So when legislators start looking at what to do to help schools, they should absolutely say, we want to engage students so much they will never leave. So we're going to make sure they've got everything they need, the best leadership, the right people, and the right technology to engage them. And if they're not throwing money at schools to do that, the legislators need to, to get their own education woke up. They need to be shook or shaken. So that's just one of the things that we got to do. We, we got to teach students creativity because a lot of them understand in their mind, they're very, very creative. The ones that we're dealing with today, they're very, very creative, but they don't understand how to expand that beyond what they're thinking about. We gotta teach them how to reach out, build teams, interact with teams, and be creative about putting together teams and problems in a time management format so they actually look at real world ways to make things work. Time management is a critical task for, all, for everybody, for the Army, for the military, for students, for everybody, but school, the, the millennials do not have good time management skills. So when you talk to them about you know, what they've gotta do, you have to build that time management program in there. And then build those critical decision-making muscles with things like I talked about, with technology that drives them to do that. Because if you don't do that, they will just soak up and then regurgitate the information they learn in schools, and they won't end up with those critical skills they need to be able to get those dream jobs or dream programs that they want to to be successful as they go through life. Now, I know my time's about up, and I'm about through with slides, so I think I got one more. Let's see here. I do. Now, one of the things that I hear all the time is that my school is an underprivileged school or I'm in a poor performance uh, part of the county and, and it's just not fair. Well, to me, fair is just a place you take your prize pig. <laughs> you know, I, I understand that life is not fair. I understand that it may be harder for you than it is for the school over there because they're throwing money at that school. But you can do it. If you think about it, if you look at it, if you say, you know what, I, I've decided that I'm going to fix this, you can do it. I have seen 19-year-old students, uh, soldiers, again, do some of the most amazing things you've ever seen. I've seen them learn how to operate intricate machines in just a few hours because somebody was shooting at them and they had to figure out how to do it quickly. I mean, they can do that. They can build those critical skills and they can get where you want them to go. But you got to quit letting them fall back on a thing saying, well, it's just not fair. I've got a hard home life, or it's not fair. I didn't get the right school you know, when I was coming. Okay, I understand that. But now, you know, we know it's not fair, but we got to do something about it. So it's not fair, so what are you going to do about it? And that's where you get to the students that we deal with, and we say, okay, you know what? You can't read well? That's fine. Let's teach you visually. You know what? You don't understand the math program? fine. Okay, that's fine. Let me show you how to do this. And what we see is that students will take blocks and they'll stack them, you know, three over here, three over here, three over here, three over here. And then what we do is I walk up there and put an X in the middle and say, well, I know you don't know it, but you just built the life, left hand, right hand rule of algebraic equations. So by doing it, by making them get in the middle of it and move things around and do things, they learn things they didn't think they would do and they grasp amazing context, critical skills, and they are successful. All right, I know that most all of you have been doing this much longer than I have. Now, we've been, we've been in business about six years, but we're close to, we're in about 750 schools, and technology is completely changing the schools that we're in. And what I'll tell you is technology is the great equalizer because we can take technology, and I can give students in the poorest school you've got the exact same education that we're given to schools that we have in, in Silicon Valley, California because they can do things like Richard was doing over here and move the heart like that or feel the heart in their hand or build a robot. All it takes 
is a little focus and great leadership. So I'm looking to you for that leadership. Thank you very much.